Blessed are those who thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Hello and welcome to our Thirsty Podcast. Uh, We're thankful to the Raised with Jesus Podcast and Pastor Peter Hagen for giving us this platform. Uh, Happy New Year, by the way. My name is Jeremy Lightning, and in this new year of Thirsty Podcasting, I would like to uh, make a resolution to stop using Z names for my co-host and uh, start a new tradition, at least for a while, and see how long it lasts. Uh, my co-host's name is Michael, not the Archangel. Uh, today, as our, long as it's not David's wife. <laughs> Mike, yo. I actually have a, a, and my wife and I have a friend from college whose name is spelled that way, but she pronounces it Mikkel. All right. Yeah. Well, and then also happy Epiphany as well, since we're recording this on January 6th. And uh, this is the longest I think it's ever taken. I apologize to introduce our guest, uh, Pastor Don Duberstein. Uh, welcome, Pastor Duberstein. Nice to be here. All right. And so, Don, where have you served in the ministry in the past? I graduated a seminary in, in 1995, was assigned to a parish in Topeka, Kansas. Topeka, Kansas. Uh, Topeka is an Indian word that means potato. And after about five years there, um, I accepted a call to uh, Port Orange, Florida, uh, kind of a mission uh, setting. And God bless the work there. Started um, a daughter to congregation in Palm Coast, Florida. That's doing well today. Uh, early childhood ministry and and uh, spent about uh, 23 years in parish ministry there before accepting about five years ago uh, the call to be director of discipleship. So tell us about that. What is, what is uh, that's a position through the synod or um, yeah, what, what's that like? It was it, it was a position that uh, was vacant for the better part of a decade, and uh, then the, there are just such great needs for uh, family, home life, youth ministry that uh, they realized uh, a commission of pastors serving when they have full time ministries themselves and they're simply volunteers. There's just no way. Uh, things uh, things just aren't going to get done. And so they brought the position back in the year 2017 uh, with that thought in mind. So quite a bit different, though, going from parish ministry, which parish ministry, that's queen, and mm-hmm. going from, uh, from those experiences into um, a kind of like uh, being a chuck wagon behind the front lines. So now you're serving the troops, but you're doing it from a distance away, providing them resources that they need. So, for instance, uh, this summer was my first time uh, ever going to the uh, youth rally, and I think that you probably had a pretty big part in putting those that that type of thing together. It is. It's it's one of the uh, maybe to backtrack. It's it is one of the areas of discipleship, but then discipleship is part of an area of ministry uh, called congregational services. Um, I I like to think that when congregations send in church mission offerings, uh, they oftentimes think of home missions, world missions, you know, that's that their, their, their money's go in support of starting uh, that kind of ministry. But then you, you just don't see uh, those monies again. But I'd like to think that this is the one area of ministry in congregational services where when, when your church mission offerings support it, it then gets turned around and is sent back into uh, congregational ministries, resources in support of uh, 1,200 plus uh, uh, churches. And so it's done in, in uh, worship resources, um, evangelism, congregational counseling, Lutheran schools, uh, special ministries, and in my area of discipleship. So with that youth rally, because uh, Jeremy and I and a couple other uh, leaders from the area went down, took a large group don't. So what can you tell us about this youth rally? Because this is the first one after COVID because we had a bunch of kids that were going to be going and then it got canceled. So what were your impressions of everything that happened in Knoxville, Tennessee? It was absolutely wonderful. There was there was a question mark about um, how, how will COVID continue to affect 
ministry, not just at the congregational level, but even at a synod level, you know, so you have a, an event in how will moms and dads react to bringing their children together uh, with thousands of others? You know, there's still the, the lingering concerns of, of what COVID is going to be. It was absolutely amazing um, to have 2,200 youth and uh, chaperones uh, come come together, uh, both for worship, uh, for uh, spiritual encouragement in all the different various workshops. But then I, I think it was it's for youth to be able to look around and see um, a collection of thousands of them. It's just the visual of I am not alone in what I believe. I'm not alone in my faith, especially at a, at a very critical uh, point in time when sometimes they do feel alone, just uh, isolated. So finding their identity in Christ and uh, letting them enjoy a setting that, that maybe um, they, they could ne- never experience in their home congregation. Yeah, and with that, uh, I remember talking uh, at the rally with one pastor, an older pastor, and he had brought one teen that was the only teen in his church but you can imagine what that's like with that one teen that he or she you know feels alone and then to be able to see hey there's 2200 others of us uh, in that believe exactly the same thing as I do and it was really interesting too in that in our group uh, you know that I have I was blessed with so many from our congregation that went to the rally and then so many of them being outgoing that they would grab other kids. And then in the evening when we would do the Bible study, our group kept kept getting larger because they would just grab onto other people. And that was one of the neat things that they didn't just stay in the click of a teen of their own teen group. They expanded and started talking to other people because there were so many other different breakout groups. They had the evening uh, the meals, but especially that the activities that they could get involved with other kids. So what are some of the other things, like examples of uh, youth disi- or, uh, discipleship, actually, that uh, you, you mentioned that uh, the worship resources or evangelism, but that's maybe not discipleship specifically. What's What else besides like putting together a youth rally is uh, under your jurisdiction? Yeah, discipleship is like um, uh, the the biggest slice of pizza, the one that's really wide and it's got all the toppings on it. Uh, it it's it involves you, you know, well, discipleship is uh, in involves uh, Jesus' invitation, "Come follow me." And um, we we think of uh, our life of following Jesus as a disciple starts in baptism and then it ends at the end of life. And so it's all encompassing of all age groups. So when we talk discipleship, we're talking discipling that's done uh, with youth, uh, uh, teens, young adults uh, that are going away to college. Um, it's it's uh, every phase of life. Uh, it's marriage. Um, it, it involves the home. Uh, so it, it goes out single. So that was one of the funny things is in the first six months that I arrived, uh, in my new position, um, the number one reason why my phone rang was with youth ministry. The number two reason why my phone rang was singles, moms and dads, grandpas and grandmas calling up saying, Hey, I I've got a couple of uh, kids. I want them married. Do you have something to bring them together? <laughs> And I did you I, did you create a dating app for them a Wells dating app? You, you know, someone commented, uh, "We didn't call you to be director of romance." <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, one of the things that you're down here in Racine for is not just to do the podcast. You know, we have our Epiphany Festival, and even though I think attendance might be light tonight because it's a Friday night, but I am very firm on. You know, January 6th, we're going to have worship on January 6th, no matter what. And But you're, you're preaching for the Epiphany Festival. So can you tell us anything about, you know, give us some highlights of the sermon? Oh, boy. Uh, highlights of the sermon. Um, it is kind of fascinating when you, when you take a look at the, uh, the account, Matthew's account of Epiphany. And um, everybody knows the story, wise men. Uh, the star, they followed it, they gave their gifts. It's interesting, though, in Matthew's account, uh, he's the only one. None of the other gospel accounts uh, record 
uh, the wise men. And so you, you kind of think of, uh, well, why, why him? Why? And I wonder if we oftentimes think of Matthew's account, uh, he's telling the life account of Jesus uh, to Jews. And it's true that I, I think he's got the perspective of uh, 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 Jesus and, and how he is connected and fulfilled Old Testament. But it is interesting how uh, Matthew begins his gospel with an account of, of a wise men who were not Jews. And then, and then he ended his gospel account uh, in chapter 28, talking, uh, giving Jesus command, uh, go and make disciples of all nations. So to me, I, I think we undersell Matthew and his perspective of, of being able to present Jesus as the universal savior of the entire world. So uh, I, I just preached on this for a chapel devotion yesterday, and one of the things that struck me was uh, Matthew was a tax collector, and uh, the wise men, I, I kind of was playing off of a lot of the um, outsiders, that they're the outsiders, and uh, they, they come into Jerusalem, and what do they do? They immediately ask a question that makes everyone feel awkward. They say, where's the one born king of the Jews? Oh, you're not supposed to do that. Herod's the king. Didn't you? Didn't anybody tell you? Uh, and uh, Matthew, as a tax collector, would have also been an outsider. And so maybe he, I just when you asked that question, I was, I was thinking maybe he related to the plight of the wise men because he was thinking, I know what it's like to be on the outside fringes of society. And Jesus found Matthew. And the wise men would not have found uh, the Christ child unless God had revealed it to them. So <clears throat> you think of the shepherds. Uh, they they found the place because um, because uh, angels announced it to them and told them where to find it. And, and the wise men found it through the star, and, and they were guided by uh, Holy Scripture. And you look at all of these different backgrounds, and you, you think the, the foolishness of uh, God was wise in taking the foolishness of the world, the foolishness of a stable, the foolishness, the, the poorness of a Mary and Joseph, and and he chose those foolish things rather than the wisdom of the world. And, and uh, that's Mary and Joseph, and then God chose you and me. So uh, I was asking uh, Michael, not the archangel, just before we started recording about uh, if I should save some of my surprises uh, for on the air. And so that's what I'm going to do now is uh, I, I didn't tell you this before we started recording, but before I came to teach at Shoreland, I was serving uh, the parish in uh, St. Mark at Salina, Kansas. So uh, I have been to your first congregation many times in Topeka, their beautiful savior. And uh, what's, what's your impression of serving Kansans? It was... They are just salt of the earth people. Uh, if if you want to raise a family in um, an environment, a, a, a geographical area of the United States that I would stay, say is is just wholesome, um, the the people are inviting. Uh, when I when I arrived in in Kansas, you know, I'm just a. Uh, 25 year old uh, pastor, but one of the members said, "You look like a 12 year old standing up there at the altar," <laughs> and and yet they they have such a high regard for God and a respect for the office of the ministry, and they they accepted me as as their pastor, and they just let me um, uh, just uh, be able to grow as a minister of the gospel. For that, I'm so appreciative. Well, if we're talking about connections to Don, so then when we were in high school together because Don and I are both alumni of Kettle Moraine Lutheran High School in Jackson, Wisconsin. And the way I know Don is, well, we played soccer together at Kettle and later on at Northwestern College. But then also, it was a very small class for Latin. You know, three of us, uh, Don and his classmate, Phil Kiesehorst, and I was a year behind them. Until the next year when I was by myself with Pastor Melberg. That was, that was a really small class. So do you have any memories of the three of of having a a Latin class of three people? Yeah, you can't hide. It's <laughs> every time you enter you got to be prepared for uh translation. But what I remember about the smallness uh, of that class. I always look back um to even think about studying 
for the ministry when you're a, you, you, you're not attending a ministerial education school. This is an area Lutheran high school. But outside of my dad's influence upon me being a pastor, it was it was Pastor Melberg who led the class, and 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 his allowing us to get him off target uh, then go on tangents. He allowed that so that we could just, sometimes we could just talk ministry. And to me, that was very impactful, uh, as, as a high school uh, student. And I, I think that was, that really helped me in the process of saying, yes, I, I think I'll, I, I want to become a pastor. See, and I actually wrote, uh, a few paragraphs in a forward in Christ a month or two ago, uh, complimenting Pastor Melberg for getting me into the ministry too. That I'd always thought about the ministry, and but the story I wrote about was that I remember going to Kettle with my mom to register for classes, and Pastor Melberg was assigned to be, you know, my my mentor. And you know, he he said to my mother and me, you know, Mike is a, a smart guy. And I think yes, I am. And then he said. You know, he'd be really good in, in studying Latin because Latin is what you need for to be a doctor or a lawyer. You know, Mike could do those kind of things. I'm, yeah, I could do those kind of things. And, you know, he was just kind of building me up and my ego being, hey, I can do this. And then so I went on to do the Latin track, not realizing that was really the pastor track. Four years of Latin, two years of German. What are you going to do with that in high school or after high school? Now, yeah, might as well just go on to Northwestern College and become a pastor. And that's what Phil Kieselhorst did too, didn't he? Yes, he did. Yeah. So I, I would expect then, based upon all that Latin background, we'll hear more of it in future podcasts. They're yeah. Not from me. But what about the German? They're you okay. took two, two years of German, you said. I did take two years of German, uh, but I don't... Uh, yeah, my German skills are, are non-existent uh, because you don't use that. I mean, it's been... Well, 88, I graduated from high school, and I did not have to take any German in college. So, you know, that's been over, you know, 30 years since I used any any Latin or German. So what uh, was different about uh, ministry in Florida as opposed to Kansas? The mission field. Uh, I, I recall you, you hit evangelism and the outreach in in uh, Topeka, I hit that just as hard as I did down in Port Orange, but th- th- there's a different culture of th- they are different cultures, and so the work that I invested in Topeka, maybe um, y- you would get uh, an average of six adult confirmands over the course of a year uh, w- with the efforts, and and then you go to a melting pot like Florida, where sixty three percent of the people in my community. Uh, did not have a church home, um, just and and yet there was uh, it, it was just it was almost easier pickings there, you know. Then all of a sudden, it, it just seemed easier just because there are so many people and so so many needs, so so much um, uh, that environment, the Southern culture, it's just wide open. Uh, mm-hmm. I found out coming back from Florida up here, there's a difference. Uh, you have to, it's almost like people will let you up to the white picket fence on the sidewalk of their homes. They'll wave at you. They'll talk with you. It's, it's nice. But it's that extra step to get through Midwestern niceties and get through their front doors. It, it, it's another uh, part of the process of uh, relationship building. Whereas in, in Florida, people would have been more like, oh, yeah, just come on in or something like that. Yeah. The, the, I always said the most dangerous question to ask in Florida to anyone was, uh, uh, how you doing? <laughs> and they will absolutely open up and they'll share everything more than you ever expected them to say. <laughs> yeah. And well, do you think, is it the locations of places like Kansas and Florida? And, you know, I served the first eight years of my ministry in Kentucky, and it's very similar to what you were saying. But do you think the time has also changed where, you know, people, they used to run to get the phone, they used to enjoy answering the door, and they used to enjoy kind of going out, and now it's, they like hunkering down, you know, they don't want to answer the phone unless it's someone they know, and even then, send me a text before you call me. Do you think the time has also changed instead of just the location? Time and people. Bible information class at the beginning of my ministry were people who 
had left church but were coming back. Uh, today, uh, at the uh, towards the end of my parish ministry, I I like ditched the Bible information class I had, and I I, I said I got to change it because the the people uh, they know nothing uh, about God's word. It's, it's not like they're coming back, but now we're truly are are, are reaching the age where. Where where people have no background in God's word, and and I think the difference too is in attitude. Uh, where before people would come to church, and uh, their the coming through the front doors was oftentimes where you first met prospects. I don't think it is anymore. I it's it's um, I, I I think we've entered the era where um, people aren't even interested in God anymore. So just to kind of clarify the first reason that you said people are different it's kind of like years ago you could drop names like noah or abraham on a non-church goer and they would at least have some kind of a basic idea that there was this story of the flood and there was a guy named abraham and now it's like you're you're kind of talking about like basic bible uh history whereas yeah like, i think we're two generations deep into it Mm. Um, so my generation, you could already begin to see, uh, the lines, uh, already being cast off and the drifting N now, uh, we're, we're looking back at the mainland almost as if you, you can hardly see it anymore. Mm. Um, and so then th that invades the homes. And so now the current generation of Gen Z or the next generation, their parents are that much more distant from God's word. Mm hmm Right, and so I'm working on my sermon for Sunday, which is going to be on the epistle lesson that we're going to be talking about later on with Cornelius and Peter, and where the epistle lesson is, it's in the middle of that story. And so I have to tell really the whole story of Cornelius and Peter, because even our best Bible people that we have in our church are not going to know that story very well let alone the stories you guys were mentioning. They, they just don't know. And that's okay, too, to be able to uh, you know, review that, that, uh, the, those Bible stories in a sermon setting and, you know, but change our, our setting. So, for example, you know, the people you're preaching to tonight, you know, those are going to be people, you know, they're going to be, if they're coming on a Friday night, you know, those are committed people. And, and yet for the people on a Sunday morning or the people you're talking to in Chapel, Jeremy, or our kids that I might be talking to in our grade school, they, they really have no Bible knowledge. But to get into some Bible knowledge, you want to get into the gospel lesson? Yes, that is a great idea. That's a good segue. And very well, very smoothly done. Uh, the gospel this Sunday, the first Sunday after Epiphany, baptism of our Lord comes from Matthew chapter 3, beginning with verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to be baptized by John at the Jordan. But John tried to stop him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, because it is proper for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then John let him. After Jesus was baptized, he immediately went up out of the water. Suddenly the heavens were opened for him. He saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and landing on him. And a voice out of the heavens said, This is my Son, whom I love. I am well pleased with him. So, Don, how did John react when Jesus came to be baptized? I envision that if I was the guy in line to be baptized and there's like this, it um, uh, looks like a young man about maybe 30 years old and he's directly in front of me. And then all of a sudden uh, I hear this shocked expression from John the baptizer, uh, absolutely floored it. And, and then hear him, him saying those words, but I need to be baptized by you. And do you come uh, to me? You can almost... Uh, see John trying to put the brakes on it. And I, I think I can kind of get that a, a little bit. If John looks up from all of his baptizing and, and sees Jesus, that's, that's kind of like the London Philharmonic Orchestra um, calling me up 
and and saying, hey, can you join us tonight? We want you uh, to be able to do Bach's um, concerto in A flat, um, and you'll be the soloist. Mm-hmm. It, it's not going to happen. It, this is like the uh, a teacher asking one of her grade school students, can you help help me with the with the lesson plans on that? Um, you, you know, it's just the the whole idea of of uh, who's the master. And who's the disciple? And even John, who had disciples, recognizes the true master that's in front of him. Right, and that's next Sunday's gospel lesson when he points, when John points his disciples to Jesus and says, "Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world." So then Matthew writes Jeremy that John led him. So why did Jesus get baptized? There are uh, several answers to this, uh, all of them right. Um, And uh, one of the short and quick ones is to fulfill all righteousness, because Jesus just says that right there. Uh, But uh, I also think it's, um, I I got a good insight from a classmate that I once heard preach on this, and he pointed out that what is it that baptism does? Baptism gives you gifts, it strengthens you, and that's as a true human, what Jesus needed, he needed strengthening. He needed to carry all the sins of the world. He needed to go out. He, right after this, he's going to go out in the desert and get tempted by the devil. Uh, it, he had a ministry to carry out, and that was going to be very taxing and, and ex- exhausting for him. Uh, and so he needed strengthening, and that's what baptism gives you is, is strength. Yeah, when I've preached on this text, you know, of Jesus in the water, that Jesus is in the dirty waters of the Jordan River already starting to get dirty with our sins, taking our sins upon himself. And Martin Luther has a great baptismal prayer, and now it's uh, it's in our Lutheran liturgy for baptisms, and I'll try and find it a little bit. But he, in that prayer, he connects baptism to the waters that drown the Egyptians in the Red Sea, to the waters that drown the unbelievers in the flood, but it also connects to the waters of Jesus in the Jordan River. So Don Jeremy kind of touched on this of why Jesus was baptized. Uh, So then What did it mean when he said, let it be so now because it is proper for us to fulfill all righteousness? Well, he came to do what we could not do for ourselves. Uh, Live the perfect life that was demanded, be the payment, to die the innocent death. He was going to do everything he needed to do. And, um, and, And now... Uh, th- this was proof of it. I mean, he's standing before John as the Messiah. I think some people might have thought John was uh, the Messiah. And Jesus is standing for, before him as the one. I am the anointed one. I am the one that has been sent. And that, that's why he told John, uh, 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 baptize me. I, I, I love that word. Let it be so now. Mm-hmm. Now, now is the time. And, and now he would, he, he would begin his work in earnest. Right. And, you know, this is part of last week's epistle lesson for the first Sunday after Christmas of that Jesus was born under law to redeem those under law. So he is under the law, you know, under the law of, of righteousness, fulfilling God's righteousness. And this is, you know, how all of these texts are, are intertwined. Jeremy, how was Jesus' baptism marking the official beginning of his ministry as the Messiah? You would look to the Holy Spirit uh, coming down on him in the dove form uh, and the Father saying, I'm pleased with him. Um, That's an echo or a repeat. We're going to hear of that is at the Transfiguration, which uh, in our Wells liturgies we like to celebrate at the end of the Epiphany season. This is the beginning of the Epiphany season. And uh, so those are two kind of uh, benchmarks of Jesus' ministry that uh, God is saying, I am pleased with him. This is this is the one. This is the Messiah. So then, Don, how does this account of Jesus' baptism confirm the doctrine of the Trinity? 
Well, they're all there. It's uh, all, all three of them. The, the voice of God, the figure of Jesus, the dove-like descent of the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, all there for something that is absu- absolutely monumental. You know, uh, great kings back in the Old Testament, they were anointed by uh, oil. Jesus, his anointing um, was of the Holy Spirit. John had alluded to that. Uh, earlier and at Jesus' baptism, now now it is happening, and I can't help but wonder. But but just because of that, how many stained glass windows in churches have this very moment in mind? You know, um, Father, Son, the Holy Spirit uh, windows, the baptismal window, all of them um, giving visuals of the significance of this one event, uh, confirming what was uh, in Matthew chapter three. Well, that was one of the questions I was going to ask with you guys, too. What kind of symbols of the Trinity have you seen in the churches you've served at or uh, just in other churches? So, for example, Don, you haven't seen our sanctuary yet, but we have a set of paintings that change during uh, the, the seasons of the church year. And so one of those paintings that's up from the seasons of Advent through Christmas and Epiphany season is Jesus being baptized. And so there you see the sun in the water, uh, the, the dove coming down as the Holy Spirit, but then also uh, you know, can't really see the Father in heaven, and yet uh, you know, it says in the Gospels of the heaven being open, it really is you know, being torn open. And I remember when our artist Melanie uh, when she brought that first set of paintings, because the Magi, that's the other painting for Epiphany season, that and Jesus' baptism, when she brought them to be installed, she did some touch-up work uh, on Jesus' baptism where she made it darker of the cloud above Jesus' head. And, you know, she was explaining, you know, it says, because her dad is, you know, Pastor Pastor Pope, so he kind of knows his stuff with church architecture and artwork, and that the Greek is there tearing open. And so, you know, making it darker of tearing open. And one of the interesting things, as I was thinking about that, of the heavens being torn open, the other time the heavens were torn open was the flood. But there it was God's judgment coming down. This, the heavens being torn open, is uh, God's pleasure coming down. This is my son with whom I am well pleased. So, Don, you have any ideas of uh, some of the great symbols of the Trinity you've seen? Not with the Trinity, but it, what you were just talking about is j- just the uh, not just the visual of it, but uh, remember, uh, seminary Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary's chapel. When you walk in and it's quiet, you hear the trickling of water, uh, uh, reminding uh, everyone who enters that chapel of um, of, of their baptism. And the importance of uh, uh, baptism. Uh, I've seen that in, in my church down in uh, Port Orange when we built it. Um, we we put the Trinity shield, embedded it into stained concrete into the floor. It's about seven feet, and and uh, uh, after it was we opened it up. Uh, the original idea was to put the baptismal font right on top of there, the with the Latin words uh, the. Uh, the, the the shield of of faith for it, and I noticed uh, simply because uh, for the dedication service we had to get the people in. We we didn't have the baptismal font on top of it, but as people entered, they refused to step on it. They just mm-hmm. went around it uh, as a as a symbol. They they saw the symbol and they understood what it meant and its significance. Mm-hmm. Jeremy, yeah, I can't think of much other than the. Uh the three rings or the um yeah the, the the sort of triangular shape but i guess as long as you bring up stained glass and uh imagery on, in the front of the church that uh the first church i served in benton harbor michigan had a stained glass window of the boy jesus in the temple so uh, there's not really the holy spirit per se uh, although he's in the reading of the scriptures and the teaching that was going on there, but there was the son, and then what did Jesus tell his uh, parents? I'm, I had to be in my father's house, so you had Father, Son, and Holy Spirit a, a little bit uh, represented there. Well, talking then about you know the symbols, and then you, Don, were talking about 
baptism. How about what kind of baptismal fonts and have you seen in churches? For example, I think of my sister's church. Uh, it's it's set up so that you come in in the back of the church. There's like five rows, and then it all kind of filters down to a point uh, up by the altar. But in the back, uh, you there's three rows that kind of come uh, pass by it. It's a huge baptismal font. It's as big as this uh, six foot table, and it's a big round. And then it's about three and a half, four feet tall with running water, and that's that's huge. There aren't a lot of churches that have that, but the idea is the way to enter into God's presence is through baptism, and you walk by that. And that's one of the things that I point out. Uh, one of the at our church uh, here. At, at a Racine campus that one of the first things I did when I became pastor here, I didn't ask anyone about it, I just did it, is I moved the baptismal font to the center because it was always off to the side and was only brought out for baptism. And that was really kind of saying, at least in my mind, baptism's not all that important. We only bring it out once in a while. Now it is right out in front in both of our sanctuaries and when I teach about baptism, I, I tell people the same kind of thing with my sister's church, except hers is in the back, to come into God's presence. The same kind of idea when you're sitting in the pews and you're looking at the altar, which is the symbol of God's presence. The only way that you and I are acceptable is because of Christ's baptism. And I, I see the font and then our baptism, which connects us through Christ, to Christ's death and resurrection so that I can come into God's presence. Don, you got something with a baptismal font? No, I, th- I think uh, you're correct. The last decades, you can see Lutheran architecture and many of the new churches being built really incorporating the visual of the baptismal font um, and how it reflects... Uh, uh, Lutheran theology, or the the importance of baptism, and, and instead of the alcove that is off to the side, so uh, I'm really pleased with that. Jeremy, uh, I don't know none that are coming to mind uh, right off the top of my head, but I guess I would point out uh, that there are alternative uses for baptismal fonts that have been decommissioned. Um, so, uh, like I know a guy who. Uh, wired one up with his own plumbing and has a a sink in one of his bathrooms that is a former baptismal font. But but the bowl on top of that does look like a baptismal font. It certainly does. And then I know another guy who got the baptismal font from his Lutheran church that he was baptized at in Toledo, Ohio, uh, where um, it's now a Baptist church. They they sold the property to a, a Baptist church, and they didn't need their baptismal font anymore. Uh, so the, he has this baptismal font in his classroom for the high school students to drop their uh, exit tickets in as they're walking out the door. And then whenever he t- teaches about, I'm talking about myself. I'm sorry. Uh, he, he teaches about bab- well, I teach he about does baptism. That all the time. He just talks about himself in the third in the royal third person. <laughs> That's right. And, uh, well, actually, I, I, I do that a lot with, um, I teach a class on First Peter, and in First Peter 3, when it talks about eight people in the ark who were saved through water, I say, and this is why uh, a lot of times you'll see baptismal fonts, and I'll, I'll lean it forward and show them, there's eight sides, because eight people were saved through water, and this water corresponds to baptism, that now saves you. And... The eight sides can also be because of the eighth day of creation. Mm-hmm. You know, that there's the six, the seven days of creation, and the eighth day is a new creation, and we're new creatures through baptism. So, so Don, obviously, Jeremy and I both have decommissioned baptismal fonts. Him in his classroom, mine in one of my bathrooms. Do you have one in your office, your home? There is one at the Wells Center for Mission and Ministry. Uh, that when when they moved the headquarters from 2929 Mayfair Road um, and designed the chapel, there actually is a baptismal font. I have asked, how, how many people have been baptized at the Center for Mission and Ministry? And uh, uh, based on the answer, uh, I'd like to see a few more baptisms there. <laughs> 
Oh, one one other famous baptismal font I, I talk about isn't really a font. You walk into it, uh, but it's not an immersion tank. It's at the Church of St. John and possibly St. John and St. Mary. It's in Ephesus. Uh, and I remember going to the ruins of this church, but they had a special room designed for baptisms. And they would have been baptizing adults, and you walk down like two or three steps, and the uh, the baptism area it was carved into a shape of a of a cross uh, with a, cent- a circle in the middle, and you walk down, and then the the pastor baptized you. But a whole room designed for baptism just says this is important. So, so Don, as we're talking about baptism. One of the great great debates in Christianity is about the mode of baptism. So let's look at Jesus' baptism. Did John sprinkle water onto Jesus' head, or do you think he totally immersed him? See, yeah, I, I was wondering where you were going to go with that question. I there's There's been so much debate about it. In, in Port Orange, Port Orange was a seaside community. And um, a lot of churches did their baptisms in the ocean. And uh, so that way they would take them out and there would be full immersion in the waves. Um, you, you talked about uh, ancient historic ruins of uh, baptismal fonts where it was just a couple steps into the water. You know, you look at the, the, the accounts of Jesus' baptism, it, it says that he went down into the water and then he came back out of the water. It doesn't say how deep the water is. And I, I guess I was going to ask you guys, well, the, where is supposedly the spot where Jesus was baptized? Because if the Jordan, if, if John the Baptist is out in the wilderness and Jesus is going out there to be baptized by him, and I do know in the wilderness, the Jordan River, there are spots where, sorry, uh, there ain't going to be any full immersions happening because depending upon the time of the year, the Jordan River in spots can only be ankle deep or even hip deep. So it, just from a logical sense, could it have been full immersion? I, I suppose. Uh, could it have been a, a sprinkling? Sure, it, it could have been. Um, I, I, I think we have always said uh, the, the word baptizo is simply uh, water as it's being applied, not dictating the form of application. You want to add anything to that, Jeremy? I, I just always tell people, you know what, he, it, it kind of seems like he probably was immersed ba- based on the, the description of him. He came up out of the water. Um, but if you're going to make an article of doctrine out of it and say this is what God commands, then you need something a little bit stronger than he probably was immersed. I did one full immersion baptism. I met with the parents, and they just had such a heart for living next to the ocean. They asked, can we have our, our four-year-old son baptized in the ocean? And so that's the, the, the one time. There I am, swimming Sudan, going out there. It's being reco- the, the parents are recording it. It's, it's just me and this four-year-old. And I hadn't thought through very well. How it, how how am I going to do this? You had not thought through, or you had thought through? Well, I I had thought through. I envisioned how it would be. It turned out not to be. The waves were a little dicey that day, and I had to time uh, the baptism of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit with three different waves. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I'm just going to throw this out there, too. I I sat in once on a school of outreach, I think, that you did in Benton Harbor, Michigan, and I happen to know that uh, you have a story about baptism uh, with your son, trying to perform it on uh, a neighbor a neighbor boy or or a dog or something yeah do you want the story or not yes okay so he's four years old uh in florida it's january neighborhood kids are over in the backyard the windows are are open and uh, my wife was in the kitchen and uh, with the windows open she could hear the kids playing in the backyard and all of a sudden it gets quiet and and uh, then she hears Caleb say with uh, Carter, that was the name of the, the other four-year-old uh, friend of his, um, he, she heard our son saying, in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. And she 
goes outside, comes around the corner, and she goes, Caleb, what are you doing? And, he, and uh, there's Caleb, and, and Carter has his head down really respectfully. And Caleb goes, I'm baptizing Carter. And she initially, she, she's shocked because <laughs> there is this thing that's called the parental consent before. <laughs> but then she notices there's, there's, no, there's no water uh, for this baptism. And, um, and uh, she goes, well, what, what were you going to do for water? And my son goes, well, does spit count? <laughs> <laughs> he was hawking up three loogies. <laughs> uh, so a couple of things on this. You know, that when it says that Jesus immediately went up out of the water, like Jeremy said, that can mean that he was under the water and then came up out of it, but it can also mean he walked up onto the shore. So what I do is I take people then to the uh, the account of the of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch when they're out in the desert, and it says that they came up out of the water. It's the same Greek word. And I just show people, if it has to mean Jesus was under the water and came up out of it, then it has to mean that because it's plural, Philip and the eunuch were under the water and they came up. And I've also performed a, an immersion. And Don, you don't. The pastor does not get under the water with the baptizee. Okay, he stays above the water. They don't both go under. They one stays up and the other, you know, may may go under. And so that's the key. Is like Jeremy said too. You can't hang everything on immersion. Has to it has to be immersion. Because Jesus was immersed, that doesn't say that. Uh, but with my immersion story, uh, I remember Thomas several years ago. He and he and his girlfriend at the time, now wife uh, Christina, that they went through my adult catechism classes, and she joined the church right away. But Thomas was a little hesitant. He was a year or two younger than Christina. And then one day after church. Uh, we were in the fellowship area, and he said, "Hey, because pa- I, I remember the exact spot in our fellowship room. And he said, Pastor, I'm ready to be baptized. I said, oh, that's awesome, Thomas. And then he said, and I'd like to be immersed. And I went, oh, no. And then he said, because I like the symbolism of having my sinful nature drowned underneath the water. So, well, all right, that's a good reason. And it was September in someone's pool. And September in Wisconsin is not super warm. I mean, it's warm enough, but not the water's not warm. And we put on our confirmation gowns. And I remember going back there, and I thought it'd be just Thomas and Christina and his uncle or her uncle and aunt were members of the church. It'd be just a few family members. The whole backyard was full. And they're all clapping and cheering, and I immersed him. And yeah, it was, that was a pretty neat baptism. So going back into the text, and what comfort is there for us in God's words to his son, uh, Don, about this is my son whom I love with him, I'm well pleased. What comfort is there for us? Well, God is, if God is uh, uh, pleased with uh, Jesus and his uh, faultless life, then um, he's going to be uh, pleased uh, with with me. So listening to the voice of the Father, um, then knowing that uh, Jesus is, if he's pleased with Jesus, he's pleased with me for all of you are sons and daughters um, of through faith in Christ Jesus. All of you were baptized uh, in, into Christ. So um, to be able to hear the Father's uh, voice in your baptism is to hear the voice of someone who is is a uh, uh, really pleased with us because of the work of his son. So Jeremy, if you're going to give a real short synopsis on the importance of baptism, what would that be? Jesus said that uh, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven unless you're born of water in the spirit. So uh, just like uh, you, you can't be a human being, well, you can't, I better back up. Uh, God thinks it's a, a big deal to have a baby, um, that your body is born. And uh, so it's it's also a big deal for your soul to be born. And that's what happens in baptism. So what would be the, Don, what would be the blessings of baptism? If we were teaching this to, you know, 
say the people you mentioned before that are coming in that have no Bible knowledge, and how would you tell them about the blessings of baptism? First family, uh, I, I think even you, you don't have to be in the faith, and yet people understand the importance of family. Um, to and they want to be with family to be able to uh, offer them and say, "This is uh, an eternal life insurance. This is this is uh, this is God saying that He wants you not only to have a family but to be part of His family." And then to be able to uh, to share with them that you don't have to be separated from grandpa and grandma at death. Um, through Christ's death, he wants you to be together with him. That means your whole family together with him. So just being able to take family, a uh, sense of belonging, having um, uh, the importance of having a father. And so many children lack both parents today. Uh, to be able to say that not only do you have a father on earth, but you got a father in heaven. One of the things that I've noticed in my preaching over the last 25 years is I've become more sacramental in my preaching. If you listen to my sermons, I'm mentioning baptism and Lord's Supper and being in the Word almost any every sermon. And just and one of those things when it comes to baptism is because I think we've gotten you get comfortable being a Christian, you kind of forget the importance of baptism. And that's one of the things I try and focus on is that baptism is not an event that happened decades ago. It's something that is valuable for us every day. Being a child of God, confessing our sins, uh, being having those sins forgiven and washed away in our baptismal waters, always being an heir of God, having his name placed on us in his baptism, that no matter what we do, we are those prodigal sons and daughters, we have a father that's always going to welcome us back in. Even at funerals, yeah, baptism becomes so prominent. And to me, that's, that, that is such a comfort. Yeah. Uh, I just had someone comment to me in my last funeral sermon. They said, I never heard a sermon like that where you just kind of went through the life of the person. Uh, from baptism on. I said, well, then you haven't heard any of my funeral sermons before because that's every funeral sermon is, because uh, one of my big things that I always meet with the family beforehand and I tell them, just so you know, the funeral director and others are going to say, well, this we're going to celebrate the life of your loved one. But my job as the pastor is to celebrate the life of Jesus in your loved one. And that begins at baptism. So they have to go through the hard work of finding the baptismal date, confirmation date, wedding date, uh, all of those kinds of things. Because that those are dates, and the dates are important, but the dates kind of mark where that person was in their relationship with God. Let's get into the epistle lesson. Jeremy, if you want to read that. Acts 10. Then Peter began to speak. Now I really am beginning to understand that God does not show favoritism, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. He sent his word to the people of Israel, proclaiming the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, because God was with him. So we talked about this a little bit before, Jeremy, of uh, this text is really starting in the middle of Acts, uh, of Acts chapter 10. So can you give our listeners background on who Cornelius is and who Peter is and the events leading up to these verses? Yes. Uh, Peter was in Joppa at the house of Simon the Tanner, and uh God wanted him to go and reach out to the Gentiles with the good news of Jesus. So he sent him a vision, a supernatural vision t about eating unclean food, and uh, God commanded him to eat unclean food. And that was basically telling Peter that uh, the old covenant is set aside now. Uh, God wants to deal with us in the new covenant of forgiveness. Uh, so 
Peter went to Cornelius' house, and uh, Cornelius also had been visited by angels and told that uh, you're going to get the good news of Jesus brought to you. And uh, that was a wonderful thing in his mind. He welcomed Peter and got kind of like you were saying before with the baptism in the backyard in the swimming pool, uh, got all of his family together and uh, made sure that they were all there to hear Peter preach. And then Peter delivered this sermon that we uh, have the beginning of in these verses. And then Acts chapter 11 is interesting that uh, there's like a church council meeting as the leaders in Jerusalem are trying to figure out what what are you doing, Peter? You know, going to the home of a Gentile. You know, it's one thing that you're going to encounter Gentiles in, in the marketplace. You can't do anything about that, but you certainly don't go to their house and you don't eat with them. And and then you don't baptize them and so forth. Uh, and then Peter, you know, he defends everything saying, you know, the Holy Spirit told me to do this. And the Holy Spirit, after baptizing them, there was a mini Pentecost there and that Cornelius and his family started speaking in tongues. So, Don, before this time, the nation of Israel was God's chosen people, but what realization did Peter finally have about God that he that he mentions in the sermon? I really have a heart for Peter on this one. Uh, walking, in, he, I mean, you think about all of his entire background. He had grown up in kind of a setting where um, uh, God likes the 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 color of Jewish noses as opposed to foreign noses. Uh, sure, he was with Jesus with a foreign woman at a well where where Jesus reached out beyond. Um, I wonder if he had forgotten that incident by then. Um, up to this point in time, uh, for a thousand years, God had asked uh, Jews to be different. Jews don't eat ham. Um, uh, if you're a Gentile, yeah, go ahead, have a ham sandwich, um, have bacon and, and with apple so- uh, applesauce on the side. But um, now it's almost like this. in this incident in Acts chapter 10, uh, Peter was handed a pair of glasses so that he could see what God sees. And it, in that vision, you know, where the blanket coming down and all of these animals that uh, uh, for, for Jews of his day would have said, yuck. And then, God, and then God changed his perspective almost in a visual way to drive home the point. Things are now different. One of the things I noticed as I was studying that, that vision, even though it's not part of this text, is that God gives Peter that vision three times, which I hadn't noticed before. And I was just thinking of that of, well, Peter denied Jesus three times. Uh, Jesus calls Peter back into his ministry three times. And now he gives this vision of, hey, you're, I think Peter knew that the gospel was for Gentiles, but putting it into practice, that's the hard thing. And what's interesting, too, here of you know the English of the EHV says, uh, as Peter preaches, now I really am beginning to understand that God does not show favoritism. And what the Greek there says, uh, I'm beginning to grasp that God does is not a face grasper. Okay, but that doesn't mean anything in our English, uh, you know, face grasper. So I, I created a meme and put it on Facebook and sent it to a couple of people of the face hugger from the movie Aliens, you know, it's on there. And it said, God is not a face grasper. And people were going, that's gross. And I told them I was going to use that as my sermon illustration, and I'm not. But but the idea is, you know, what does it mean to be a face grasper is, I think it's tying into when God says to the prophet Samuel, who wants to anoint the next king of Israel after Saul, and he wants to anoint any of the brothers except for David, and God says, you know, man looks at the outward appearance. They're face grabbers, but God looks at the heart. He is not a face grabber. I think that's just an interesting way of looking at the, at the Greek there. Uh, you don't really see with the, with the English. Jeremy, why does Peter point to Jesus' baptism as such an important event in the ministry of Jesus? He uh, says that, he he identifies that as the time that Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit and uh, when he began his ministry uh, and went around doing good and healing all oppressed by the devil. 
And we touched on this a little bit, but we can re- review it here, Don. What did Jesus receive in his baptism? Because Peter mentions it here. Go back up to the, uh, let me go back up yeah. to the account. Continue. Oh, yeah, verse 38. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Yeah, I think, I, I think that, doesn't that allude to, uh, Peter was looking at the outward change, and this is the this is the power. The Holy Spirit can only change what no human being can change, and that is uh, what is on the inside. So, um, it, baptism there's a there's a change of mind, a change of heart, change of of loyalty from from one way and one direction to uh, a new way, God's direction. And then I think, too, one of the things to point out is right after Jesus is baptized, I think it's in Mark that, you know, it says immediately ado that the Holy Spirit drove uh, Jesus out into the desert to, for his uh, defeating of the devil's temptations. So by the Holy Spirit, you know, he, he's been anointed as his role of prophet, priest, and king to do this work. Now, it, it didn't change Jesus like it changed Cornelius and his uh, and his family. But I wanted to ask you guys this. It was just something I was thinking of because it does say in the beginning of Acts chapter 10 that he was a God-fearing man, and yet uh, does it seem like he does not know Jesus, that he's a proselyte, you know, meaning a, a convert to Judaism, and yet he does not yet know that Jesus is the Savior? Have you guys thought about that? I heard a good uh, devotion from uh, one of our professors at uh, MLC on this. And the way that he put it, uh, he said the same thing about uh, Lydia later in Acts 16, that they both had an Old Testament faith. And if they would have died, God forbid, before hearing about the Messiah, we have every reason to believe that they would have gone to eternal life because they were trusting in the Messiah that was to, they were trusting God's word. And that's, that's the main thing. And uh, so what they were getting is, I like how he put it, was an upgrade of faith. So they were, they were believing in the Savior who was coming, but they didn't realize that he had come. Right. Which is kind of like a, if you're, you're receiving a celebrity endorsement. So if if God drinks Pepsi, we're not drinking Coke anymore. Uh, this because this is if this is what what God says is best, then we're going to do it do it His way. I was I was listening to the Lutheran Confessions this week, and I was listening to uh, what Luther has to say about baptism uh, in his large catechism. And one of the things that he says is about if. If God told you to hold up this feather and you were saved by this feather, you would uh, esteem that feather higher than any other fellow feather or anything else in the world. And you know he's making the comparison that it's a simple water. And yet God says, this is how you become a child of God. You're saved through baptism and so forth. Esteem that water higher than anything else in the world. Just that the way Luther puts it as a bat, as, as a feather. The stigma of pork is now gone. You can eat it. The stigma of sin has been removed. You don't have to worry about it anymore. You aren't a slave to sin. So the last question I have for you guys is, you know, in this lesson we learned that God wants all people to be baptized. Is there any one baptism that you can think of that uh, you know, was really special to you? I, you know, I told my story about Thomas and so forth. And another one I can think of is uh, Cordell Jr. Uh, that this hap- happened several years ago that mom and grandma were in church and it, they were here early. And I was talking to them beforehand and Christine had just had her baby. And I said, oh, that's awesome. Well, the baby was like three or four months premature. And they said, yeah, right after church, we're going up to Children's Hospital. And I said, well, I will come up there. And, and I went up. And you know, Cordell Jr., he had a lot of health problems, and he still does because he was born so early. Uh, but he was small enough to fit in my hand. And he's in the incubator. And when I baptized, when I baptized children, 
or adults or even babies, I get I'm getting them wet. I have a shell that I use for baptism. You know, connecting that idea that Jesus may not have been immersed, and so the shallow shallow water of the Jordan River. What is John going to use? A shell to to baptize them. Uh, that's why you see a shell in so many famous paintings of Jesus' baptism. Well, I'm not going to get Cordell Jr. soaking wet in his incubator. I was given uh, sterilized water and three drops of water you know, for the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, barely getting him wet, and yet that was enough to save that little child. That's one of my memorable baptisms. Don? Yeah, something similar um, in Kansas— young couple, had a couple of miscarriages before. Um, then she uh, became pregnant, and but then started having compl- complications about, I, I would say, six months in. And uh, the doctors told her uh, it won't, will not be able to, it's, uh, to survive. And so she gave birth. The child lived 21 minutes, mm. just long enough for baptism. And when you're with a grieving young couple that and there there again we're we're back to it uh, the the comfort of baptism uh, not just for our life where you could wake up every morning and or go to bed at night and nothing went went well the entire day and yet you can say the one thing we got going for us is uh, I am a baptized child of God Jeremy oh i got nothing to top either of those stories <laughs> but What you were saying, Don, is I'm a baptized child of God. One of the hymns that we're going to be singing in church by us is it has that refrain, I am, I am baptized. You know, just over and over again in that hymn, we sing, I am baptized. And one of my favorite verses in there is when the devil comes tempting you, and then it's like the author of the hymn is saying, you shout at the devil, you know, get away from me, Satan. I am baptized into Christ. It's just a great thing for our, our people to remember uh, just whenever the devil is coming at you, whenever you need that comfort, just say out loud or yell at the devil. I am baptized. So we'll wrap it up here. Uh, this is Michael Zarling with Don Duberstein. And since we're celebrating Epiphany tonight, follow the Epiphany Lightning. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wants the water of life take it as a gift. Stay thirsty, my friends, then drink deeply from the water of life.